I just want to recap what we did with the first order differential equations. And so we essentially have three strategies. There's the is it separable strategy that says, hey, I have a way to actually move things around. So I can move variables so that all of one variable is on the other side, all of another variable is on the other. Now, on a side note, one thing you can look for is separable uh, looks really good, or, or I should say works really well, uh, when you have lots of multiplication. So if you have lots of stuff multiplying together, that's usually a, a sign like, oh, I can probably you know, divide stuff and move stuff around, and the, the stars will align, and things will work. So that's one thing you can look for. And then we said, well, what about linear? So linear is, uh, you have like a, a single y, a single y prime, and you look like something times y prime plus something times y equals something. I'm being very vague here. There's nothing special about y. It could be any variable. But in particular, it's like, it's really simple in terms of what we're trying to, to find the function for. And if it is linear, well, then there's a technique. You find the integrating factor, and that turns the left-hand side into a derivative, and life is good. You know? So what you end up with, well, it's, you end up with something that looks like the derivative of a special thing times y equals stuff. Really, that's what you want to get to. That's the idea with linear equations. And aha, easy to integrate a derivative, and life is good. And then we said the third idea was, what if it's exact? Well, what does that mean? Uh, well, we kind of said, uh, this is good when things look hopeless. And uh, well, in this case, we integrate the stuff times dy, and we integrate the stuff times dx, dx and, uh, and we make sure that they're somewhat compatible, and uh, if you did the quiz problems, you'll see that you know, sometimes you've got to be careful. And then you put the answer together. And it's actually pretty quick. Sometimes when things look hopeless, that's actually the best. Because it's like, wow, that was fast. So anyways, those were the main techniques. And the last sort of idea was to say, well, if it's not one of these right away, maybe we can substitute or manipulate. Now, manipulate is just a fancy way of saying rewrite. That's a lot of math. A lot of math is just, hey, I don't like this problem as it's written, but I can rewrite it to something much nicer, something I can solve. And so you want to be able to have that ability. Now, substitution, there's a, a couple of ones that you should be able to spot because they, you know, they come up from time to time. There's the homogeneous variety. And uh, well, I should say that the, the two main ones, there's the homogeneous and there's the Bernoulli. But Bernoulli, I know it sounds complicated. Uh, homogeneous is z equals y over x. But Bernoulli is just saying, oh, substitution is z equals y to some power. That's what Bernoulli is. That's all Bernoulli is. It's not something scary. It's just like, oh. So like one of the most obvious things to try. And in general, it's like, think about putting on your calc one hat. You know, if you're thinking about substitutions, you're like, well, where do I look for substitutions? Well, functions inside of functions. Uh, you say, oh, you know, do I have the derivative of something? OK, well, then that should be a substitution, and things like that. Now, generally speaking, it can be hard to develop that substitution skill it takes a little bit of practice. I'll be honest with you. And the first thousand problems are always the hardest. And after that, it gets a little bit easier. But, uh, but we won't throw anything crazy at you. We'll, we'll give you something that we know that you can do. Now, there's a warning at the bottom. You might say, aha, I have become a master of first order differential equations. I can now solve any first order differential equation. Uh, no. Uh, it turns out most differential equations are hard to solve, even first order ones. And, uh, and so there's a lot that we can't do. But the ones that we ask you to solve, you'll be able to solve. 
Now you might be saying, so wait, are we done with the class? Well, no. There's lots of things left. We're going to move into second order. And you might say, wow, are we going to have a much longer list? Actually, the opposite. It's going to be a much shorter list. Things get more difficult. And uh, so, you know, in some sense, this is as hard as it gets. It's all downhill from here, except for the uphill parts. So, any questions? No? All right. Good. Good. Well, today's topic. We're going to talk about some population models. And so uh, population models is really just talking about we, we have things that we're interested in talking about growth or possibly decay. Things are, are getting larger, things are getting smaller. So we phrase it in terms of population. And we say, okay, well, if we, if we put on our, our differential equations hat for a moment, we say, if I want to understand how something is changing, well, that really says, you know, P prime. I, I split into like, how is something going up? How is our population increasing? Though, so that might be if we're, we're thinking about, you know, uh, some sort of living organisms, births or th things are entering in immigration. You say, how is your population declining? Uh, deaths, people, things are leaving, people are moving out. And, uh, but of course, it's not just living things. Lots of things follow models like this, things like radioactive materials. So you often hear about radioactive decay. And so that's something that also follows these types of same models. You know, how much radioactive material there is, it, it depends upon, uh, the, the change depends on how much there currently is. Uh, investments in finances, chemicals in the bloodstream, uh, all sorts of things can be modeled in the same way. So we're going to start with a fairly simple model. Say, look, only thing happening is we have births and deaths. All right. And let's make it really, really easy. We say, when we want to find how many births we have, we say a certain percentage of our population chooses to reproduce. So it's proportional to the size of the population. The larger the population, the more births we have. The smaller the population, the less births we have. Okay. And the same thing happens with deaths. Again, it's proportional. So a large population, lots of people die. Because, well, there's a lot of people. A small population, relatively few die. But that's because it's smaller. So we say, all right, if we think about it here, we have our, our births are like some scalar times p. Our deaths are like some scalar times p. So if we write this out, you really have how you're increasing, subtract how you're decreasing. If you think back to our mixing problems, you know, remember how we said like we have things coming in, things coming out? Same idea, things coming in, subtract things going out. And we say, okay, well this turns out, just pull out the p, it's some constant times p. So we start with a very simple model. Our, our rate of change, our p prime, is proportional to p. Okay, so that's what we'll start. It's called the exponential model. And so let's start here. Find the general solution to p prime equals kp and p of zero equals p naught. All right, well, hmm, how can we solve something like this? p prime equals kp. What technique would you like to use to solve that? Separable. Yeah, this is like very separable, right? So this could be written as dp over dt equals k times p. And we can rewrite that as dp over p equals k dt. So separate. Separate, then integrate. What's the integral of dp over p? Natural log, Natural log of p. What's the integral of k dt? K, k times t. And then plus c. All right, good. Now we're almost there. If I want to solve for p, well, what do I do? 
Raise both sides of the power of e. Yeah, put, put both sides into the exponential function, raising both sides, e to the both sides. So e to the log p would become p. e to the kt plus c would do what? It would be certainly e to the kt. And now this plus c, well, you can think of it as e to the kt times e to c. So remember, addition upstairs becomes multiplication downstairs. Then e to the c is just another constant. So we'll just upgrade our c. So this is like, you know, c plus. If we did it again, we'd have c plus plus, and then we'd be pretty good. We could program. All right. So we do have some initial conditions. So let's solve. All right, so now we solve for C, and we do that, we plug in time equals zero, we should have this value P naught. So that says P naught is equal to C times E to the zero. All right, so we end up with C equals, well, E to the zero, one, yeah, so C is P naught. So our final answer, the solution is P zero E to the K Now, why do you think they call this the exponential model? What is that? Yeah, that's e to the kt. It's an exponential function. And hence the reason why they call it an exponential model. All right, now, it, there is something where it has described the behavior as t goes to infinity for various choices of k. Now, various choices of k, there are three interesting choices. k is less than 0, k equals 0, k is greater than 0. Which one do you want to start with? So here's our p0, our p0, and our p0. All right, so which one should we start with? K equals zero. If we choose K equals zero, plug K equals zero into here, what do you have? You always get E to the zero, which is always one. So what does that say about your population? It's constant. It's a steady state in some sense. It's like, it's not going up, it's not going down. We could say, you know, births equals deaths, but nothing changes. All right. How about k less than zero? So if k is less than zero, e to the kt, what happens as t gets bigger? So that's, it's a negative upstairs. It gets smaller. Yeah, so if you have a large negative upstairs, e to that is a small value. So in the long run, you go down. So this would be a case for, <clears throat> excuse me, this would be a case. This would be a case where the number of births is smaller than the number of deaths, so the population is dying out. This is also, by the way, the case for uh, anything that has sort of a decay, like radioactive decay follows this. So you have some amount of radioactive material, then over time it will sort of change into some other state. And the amount of material left that's radioactive goes down. But it takes a while because it's an exponential function. Okay, what if k is positive? What happens? Yeah, it goes up. Because you have a large positive, which means it's going to go up and up and up. Now, you might ask the question, is that a realistic model for a population? One person said yes, because they wanted to be contrary. No, it's not realistic, you know. Things happen, there's something that somehow keeps populations in check. Well, okay, well, so we'll come up with other models in a few minutes. Okay, so, let's try an example with this one. So, when sugar is dissolved in water, the amount that remains undissolved after t minutes satisfies the differential equation a prime equals minus ka. 
if 25% of the sugar dissolves after one minute, how long does it take for half of the sugar to dissolve? Now, let's think about using some sort of our naivete. You know, we're a young person. We don't know how awesome differential equations are. And we say, ah, 25% dissolved after a minute. I want 50%. So that's just two rounds of 25. So it should be two minutes, right? Well, of course, 2.41 doesn't match with 2. What's wrong with that thinking? So someone said it doesn't take into account how much was involved in the first time. In some sense, yeah, we lost 25%, but the next time we take off 25%, it's sort of less of that we're you know, taking it out of. So we have to somehow account for that. So, so question, should it be more than two minutes or less than two minutes then? So it should be more, because when we take off our second round of 25%, it's not out of 100, it's, it's out of you know, a little bit less. So two, it's got to be above two minutes. If our answer is below two minutes, we're in trouble. So far, 2.41 is looking promising. Now, this looks like a stuff that, you know, it's like, ah, this must be a problem in our class. But a lot of the stuff we're going to do, you'll be like, oh, we could have done this five years ago. And you probably did, you just didn't have it phrased this way. We see a prime equals minus ka. We say, aha, we know stuff about a prime equals minus ka. What does that tell us about a? What kind of behavior does it look like? It's exponential. Because we recognize this as the exponential model. Anytime we see a prime equals constant a, we're like, oh, I know what A looks like. So A always looks like A naught, E, whatever is in front of there, so it's minus KT. That's it, we, we automatically know. We don't even have to think about it. We don't have to keep rederiving it. This is one we know. Now, 25% of the sugar dissolves after one minute. So, let's translate that statement. 20 part, sorry, okay, so one minute says t equals one. 25% of the sugar dissolves. A is how much is undissolved. So how does A at time one compare to A naught? So A of one, we've lost 25%. How do we compare to what we started with? We have 75% of what we started with. So we could write this as 3 fourths times A naught. So that's that first half of the sentence. Now, the second half. How long does it take for half of the sugar to dissolve? So it's asking for a time, because that's a, what it means by long. So we want A of t equal to what? 0.5 A naught, or a half A naught. So this is what we want. All right, well, how do we use this? We can take this information of what happens at time one and use it to get information about k. So in particular, we have 3 fourths a naught is a naught e to the minus k times one. What happens with our initial amount a zero or a naught? It cancels. It doesn't matter what the initial amount was. Because in exponential models, oftentimes when you're trying to ask, you know, how much until a certain portion is left, it doesn't matter what you started with. Okay, so we have 3 fourths is e to the minus k. Well, how do I get that minus k outside of e? Take the natural log. Natural log of 3 fourths equals minus k. Or move the k across. k is minus natural log of 3 fourths. If you want, you can put the minus inside. That just flips it over. Natural log 4 thirds. All right, now we know k. So we're after a time t. So we want 1 half a0 to be equal to 
A0, E, and I'll leave this as minus KT just because it takes too long to write log 4 thirds. Now what? The A0s cancel, cancel out again. So we never needed to know the initial amount. Never mattered. Do the same thing we did before. Log of a half equals minus k times t. You can move the minus across. k times t is minus log of a half. You can do the same thing you did before. Put the minus inside. That's log 2. So finally to get t, we divide. And therefore, we end up with t is log of 2 over log of 4 thirds. So, is that right? What, what does that number turn out to be? I hope it's 2.41. Is it? All right, I'm, somebody's saying, it is totally right. So, woohoo, yay. All right. So anyways, these aren't so bad. Now, I just want to note something here. This type of thing, you'll, sometimes we'll hear problems talk about a half-life. And no, it's not referring to the video game. Uh, it's just saying how long until half is left. This is essentially a half-life type problem. You might also hear other problems talk about doubling time. How long does it take for your population to double? And that's in a case when something is growing. If I want to find doubling time, what would I change in this formula? Yeah, make that half a two. So if you ever hear half-life or doubling time, it's just like, oh, how long until half is left, or how long until you have twice as much as what you started with. So, but really, no, no big surprises. The only part that's really the differential equations part is just saying, aha, I know how to translate this to say that we have an exponential function. And then most of the rest of it uses uh, algebra, which we love algebra. All right. Well, that was one model. Let's do a different model. The logistic model, which, all right, uh, what is that? Well, so the logistic model says, you know, th there's this unbounded growth isn't reasonable. We should somehow modify our argument. So maybe there's a couple ways we can modify it. But one way we could say, you know, the larger our population grows, there's, there's constraints in the environment in which it's placed. So in some sense, our, our rate of death should somehow scale with our population. So a large population would have an even faster rate of death than a smaller population. So that's where this, this extra P is coming from. It's saying, hey, if your population is getting too large, your death rate speeds up. But we simply will write it as saying p prime is equal to k times p times m minus p, and where k and m are some constants. All right. So this is the logistic model. But, of course, there's the question we can ask. What's the solution? Because I don't know if we have a function called the logistic function. Well, not yet. Maybe we'll have one in a few minutes. So we want to find the solution, and after we find it, we want to give an interpretation of m. All right. So, okay, like I said, we've become really good at solving differential equations. We should be able to handle this. It's a first-order differential equation. No surprises, no surprises. So a question. How do you want to approach this? And I'll even give you two choices, and you can pick. You can approach this by separable or by Bernoulli. Which approach would you like to see? There's a couple of people murmuring separable, and one person's like, Bernoulli! And, uh, and so there's a lot of people like, I would rather not see a solution. I, I, I don't really know if I like this function, Steve. Uh, we can do Bernoulli. It, it depends what you like. I, okay, we'll do Bernoulli. We'll do Bernoulli. 
Okay, Bernoulli is uh, less exciting. If we had done separable, we would have gone to do partial fractions, but we'll save that for later in the semester, I guess. Okay, so if we're doing Bernoulli, you might say, wait, is this Bernoulli? So, uh, so first off distribute, you have K times M P minus K times P squared. And then we can move this across. So you get P prime minus K M P equals minus K P squared. Okay, so we've expanded and rewrote. How do you know if something's Bernoulli if you write it in this way? Do you remember? Uh, if you covered this part up, what would you see? It's linear. So it's like, oh, this silly P squared makes it not linear. Ah, we would have gone away with it too if it weren't for that P squared. Okay, so what really says, hey, here's what you do. Divide everything by that P squared. And so we get that uh, P prime over P squared minus K M one over P is equal to minus K. And we make a substitution. What's the substitution we make here? <coughs> yeah, this part is where we find our substitution. So, the one over P will become our Z. So if Z is one over P, what is Z prime equal? If you like, one over P is the same as P to the minus one. So it'd be negative one over P squared. The negative one comes down, because we're taking derivatives. You subtract one, so that's negative two, so that's the P squared downstairs. And P prime, yeah. All right, well, we're in luck. We're very close. What's the only thing we're missing? Negative sign. So negative Z prime minus KM times Z equals negative K. Well, we're all optimists here. Let's just make that all pluses. So Z prime plus KMZ plus K, sorry, equals plus K. Okay, great. And we're already in luck. We've already got the Z prime to have a one in the front. So now we come to the what's in front of the Z, that coefficient. What's the integral of K times M? With respect to T. KMT. Because they're constants. So what's our integrating factor? e to the kmt. So we get e to the kmt z prime plus km e to the kmt times z is equal to k e to the kmt. Oh, but it's not as bad as it looks. This left hand side is a derivative of our integrating factor, so k times m times t times z. All right, so far we're in pretty good shape. What comes next? Integrate, good, good. You're picking up, you've got that rhythm. We've got rhythm, we can solve it. Bum, 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 ba -dum, bum, ba -dum, bum. Okay, I'm gonna move this to the side. We'll come back to that in a second. Okay, integral of the left-hand side will leave us with e to the k times m times t times z. Good. Integral of k times e to the kmt. Yeah, so it'd be e to the kmt, and then we're going to divide by that constant, which is km. There's already a k, so k divided by km is 1 over m. And of course, 
plus our constant C. Okay, now we're getting close. Uh, let's divide through by e to the kmt. So z is equal to 1 over m e to the km times t plus c. And what would go here? Well, oh, what, not, no, this would just go away. Well, huh, huh, huh. I know how to divide. This would be minus kmt. All right, now I didn't say an initial condition, but I'm going to give you an initial condition. I want the population at time zero to be p naught. Okay, so uh, by the way, what was z? 1 over p. Let's solve for c. So, we plug in. At time t equals 0, our population is p0, p0. 1 over p0 is equal to 1 over m plus c times c times 1, because it'll be e to the 0. Ah, great! That says c is easy. So what is c? Well, it's 1 over p0 minus 1 over m. But we can rewrite that. We have the technology. It's called common denominator. So m minus p0 over m times p0. Okay, so let's recap where we're at. We're almost there. So we have 1 over p, which is equal to 1 over m, plus this m minus p0 over m p0 e to the minus k m t. How are we doing? Everything's good? If I wanted to add these two together, what would we do? Yeah, so we want common denominators. So, so we say, hey, they both have m downstairs. So multiply the first term by p0 over p0. So we could say, oh, this is the same as p0 plus, oops, I'm going to run off the page here, m minus p0 e to the minus k m t all over m p0. And we're almost done because this isn't our answer. It's close. How do we get our answer? Flip it over. And therefore, we behave like m p0 over p0 plus m minus p0 e to the minus k m t. Okay, so I'm going to copy that over here. So p is equal to m p0 divided by p0 plus m minus p0 e to the minus k m t. Now, you might be thinking like, oh my gosh, if I had this on a test or on a quiz and I had to figure out going from here to here, would I have to do all of that work again? The answer? No. The reason is because it's on the formula sheet. This is our first new entry. We've worked on it, and now it's like we've got the top part of the second column. Oh, life is good. Life is wonderful. Okay, so. We now have our solution. Okay, all right, we'll put that aside. Now, what's M? That's a good question. Let's think about what happens. First off, let's do a quick check. If we plug in T equals zero, 
What happens to this term? Goes to 1, right? So it's like it's not there. Downstairs, P0 plus M minus P0. M. If I divide M times P0 divided by M, we have P0. So at time 0, we get P0 out. So woohoo, that's good. We did something right. Well, we did many things right. We signed up for differential equations. That was the first step. All right. Now, the question. OK. It says here k is positive. Now, let t get big. What's happening to this part as t gets big? It gets small. Because you have e to a large negative. Which means, in the long run, that goes away. So, if that goes away, what are you left with? The P zeros cancel, you're left with M. All right, so what is M? Well, there's a couple ways to think about it. So, one way, a fancy way, if you're thinking like biology, you could call it carrying capacity. It's like, what's the, you know, what does this environment support? I also like to think of it, it's the long run population. If you just say, look, let time keep going, that's where you're going to go in the long run. And in particular, it's really fun to look at some various cases here. So here is M. And I already can tell I'm not going to like this picture, so I'm going to get a new piece of paper. Here is a better piece of paper. Here is M. All right. If our population is down here. What will happen? In the long run, what should we do? Increase we'll increase to M. If our population is up here, what should happen? It will decrease to M. So it says, look, you know, you have room to grow, you grow. If you're like, oh, too many people, okay, you get, your population is going to start dying off until you get to M. What if you start exactly at M? Yeah, you chose wisely. Because you know? if you're exactly M, notice you'll have M minus M, zero. Goes away. P prime is zero. Nothing changes. Now, this, of course, assumes K is positive. What would happen if K were negative? The derivation doesn't change. This is still the same, same formula. What do you think will happen now, though? Well, I'll tell you, if you pick M, you're going to stay at M because your P prime is zero. But now, if I have, have K is negative, then that says if I let T go large, I'll have E to a, a large number. So what's happening downstairs? It's getting big. So now, instead of heading towards M, we move away from it. Now that's one thing. What happens if you're above? Well, if you're above, it's catastrophic. You actually will approach an asymptote. And things will blow up. So. Uh, so, that's something that can happen. But anyways, all right. We have a few minutes. We should try a problem. Okay, let's see. We'll do this one. The population of a certain fish is measured in tons and it follows the logistic model. P prime equals K times P times 100 minus P. Now, given that in 2010 the population was 50 tons, and that in 2020 the population was 80 tons, then determine the rate of growth of the population in 2010. All right. Now, a couple things we note. We have 
P prime equals KP times 100 minus P, which means what? It means we're logistic, right? And so we don't have to rederive that. We say, hey, we pull out our formula. So I happen to have my formula nearby. You know, and we say, oh, OK, so that means that our population P would be equal. So M equals 100. So uh, what's our P0? We sh we'll say that 2010. That's our initial time. So P0 equals 50. M equals 100. So we have 50 times 100 over 50 plus 100 minus 50. Ooh, that was very convenient. Nice, thank you. And then E to the minus 100 KT. So, so that's the problem. That's the model, I should say. Now, that's what we're given. Now, in 2020, we're at 80 tons. So, P0 equals 50, that's the time zero. 2020 would correspond to what time? 10. So the population in 10 years is going to equal 80. All right, well, how can we use this information that the population in, in 10 years equals 80 tons? What does that help us find? It can help us find K. It's the same thing as we did in the previous problem. Uh, let's just simplify here. Notice how we have tons of 50s. So we can pull out and cancel out 50. So this becomes 100 over 1 plus E to the minus 100 KT. So we plug stuff in. And what we get is we get that 80 is equal to 100 over 1 plus e to the minus 1,000k. Because 100 times 10 is 1,000. Well, how do we get the k by itself? What are some things we can do? OK, someone said we can cross multiply. We'll start there. Why not? Where do we go? Divide by 80. 1,000 over 80. You can cancel off. They're both divisible by 20, so that's 5 fourths. So 1 plus something equals 5 fourths. Subtract 1. E to the minus 1,000k equals 1 fourth. Natural log both sides. So minus 1,000k is equal to uh, minus natural log of 4. So that's natural log of 1 fourth. And so what is k? So k is natural log of 4 over 1,000. All right. Now, believe it or not, we're less than a minute away from being done. I know that because we have less than a minute of class. And we're going to finish this before class ends. The only hard part is, what is it we're looking for? It, it says, determine the rate of growth. Now, what's another name for rate of growth? P prime. Do we know how to find P prime? They gave it to us right here. We say, oh, P prime. Now, in 2010, what was our population? 50. So we put in P equals 50 times 100 minus 50. That's our P prime. The only thing we didn't know was we didn't know K. But what do we know now? We know K. So this is log of 4 over 1,000 times 50 times 50. And uh, I mean, you can clean this up. For example, 50 into 1,000 gives you 20. Then you get the zeros to cancel. So the answer is 5 halves log 4. And we're done. And we really are done, because that's it. Class is over.